Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for being here and uh, physically present or remotely present. Um, I'd like to thank my colleague and old friend uh, for his kind words and exposing my age, which is not the purpose of this project. <laughs> Privacy is very important, actually, in age verification, but I don't mind. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for hosting us here in a beautiful building. And it, it has and cleared up a lot of doubts. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I can use this one, I believe. Um, I'm going to give you a small presentation. Possibly most of you have already heard about these things, but I would like to stress some uh, to, to put the attention in a couple of points that are very important in this project. Um, I'll start with what was in the program. The, uh, phase one, as we c used to call it, uh, EU Consent Project, is the phase of the project that was funded by the European Commission. So this first uh, phase of the project um, had a purpose of actually uh, trying to find solutions around uh, uh, child protection uh, in uh, the digital world as we know it today. And uh, one of the key points uh, there was uh, uh, to understand, first of all, what are the available solution, technical solutions uh, across Europe in order to help in that direction. And then secondly, uh, try to see whether an in interoperable uh, f platform would allow a much easier and smoother uh, <coughs> use of those solutions across the internet. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, stress a little bit interoperability because interoperability, uh, you see the definition on your screen, but interoperability is very important because we would like to, to make the usage of uh, the systems overall, the, the browsing, the, use, the daily use of uh, a child, of an adult, make it as smooth as possible. Interoperability can help us with that. It's just like the single sign-on that you have when you're using Google or other applications. And it's very important in order not to be forced to do again and again the same authentication, authorization, whatever. All those kinds of security elements that at the end makes, us, uh, makes our life more difficult. When we, go, we need to go from one side to the other and we have to put in our own credentials in order to log in, uh, then we start getting a little bit anxious, worried, a little bit, we don't like it, let's put it like this. A smooth browsing, a smooth usage of internet services means that we authenticate once, we just do it at one time, and then from then on we have a session that is open and that session allows us to use the system continuously. This is what interoperability is all about. And it's very important because in today's world we're going to see more and more websites that we're going to try to identify the, user, the age of the user. Therefore, they will use different providers in order to be able to identify that age. But if those providers work inter interoperable across them, then that would mean that the user will see no difference. The user will move from one side to the other without having to re-login, without having to re-authenticate, without having to show something to the system in order to move from one place to the other. And I believe that this is very important. It's very uh, user-friendly, and therefore, uh, because everybody's looking for usability, usability is key and interoperability is key uh, in order to achieve uh, usability. Now, what did we try, uh, what did we try to achieve during the previous project, the phase one project? Clearly, enable children to enjoy a safer digital world throughout the European Union. Uh, the truth is that uh, we try to extend that across over the European Union, and our goal in the future is to have EU consent being a global uh, solution that can be used across the world and not only in Europe. Now, this is a technical, uh, let's say, diagram that we have developed uh, several years ago. It's still true. Uh, the main components of that diagram are, are there. Uh, the idea is that the user logs in or checks himself up once, and then from then on, uh, the systems on the back end work together in order to allow the user to move smoothly from one system to the other. 
Um, the, the phase one project had lots of partners across Europe. Uh, it was a little bit biased towards the northern part of Europe because we all know that the northern part of Europe possibly, well, I believe is more conscious about the problem of age, uh, of age overall. Um, but the truth is that uh, we had partners from the southern part of Europe, like us, uh, even I consider Romania part of uh, uh, the southern part of Europe. Therefore, um, there was, we tried to have a balance across Europe. Um, the other thing that was very important, I believe, from the beginning of the project and the way that we set it up was that we tried to have all parties involved in the process. And by talking about all parties, uh, we started with children, and um, most of you don't know, but we interviewed hundreds of children across Europe in order to understand their needs and to understand how they feel about this uh, new way of identifying the age of a user on the internet world. The parents as well, we talked at the same time to parents. We talked to other adults that didn't have kids. Um, and obviously we talked to the main, let's say, uh, components of this network that are, first of all, uh, the age verification providers and the parental consent providers. Um, we talked to EIDAS nodes that are, well, uh, part of this solution at the time, and it still is part of the solution. Um, and as well, uh, we tried to extend that to everybody that was to service providers that are the ones that are actually have to use this technology. So by using the technology, they have to uh, collaborate with us. Um, we set up the advisory board with the help of uh, John Carr and uh, Ian as well did a great job in uh, interacting with the entire industry uh, and I believe that it's, uh, you see some of the advisory board members here and the next slide, um, we, we managed to cover almost everybody with an interest in uh, that technology and that solution. And I believe that was fundamental in this project because we heard a lot of opinions from across the industry. And that was very good because we had conflicting partners as well in the, in the board, but that was the beauty of that board because we heard all the opinions. Now, what we identified, we clearly saw from the beginning is that interoperability is not possible without a standard. There is no way that you can achieve interoperability if you let everybody set up a, let's say, a protocol, but then uh, let everybody implement that protocol their own way. So from the beginning, from the proposal phase of the project, we realized that we had to have a standard that will define what is the minimum level that all the partners have to achieve in order to be part of that interoperable network. And this is a work that Tony and his team uh, took on board very successfully, and he's going to tell you a little bit more later on about what are the results of that uh, work. What did we deliver? We delivered clearly standards and protocols. We delivered a prototype that we ran across four uh, member states uh, with more than 2,000 uh, users. Uh, with a very good success rate. In reality, we ran uh, user satisfaction surveys at the end, and we had more than 85% user satisfaction, which for a first time pilot prototype of that scale, I believe that it was extremely satisfactory. What is EU consent today is a virtual network. It relies on, EU cons on EIDAS as the baseline technology because we wanted to have the EIDAS nodes, and for those of you that don't know EIDAS, EIDAS is the network that allows citizens of Europe to log in, to use their identity across Europe. And this part of identity, one part of this identity, the age, we wanted to reuse it in our network. And uh, we have demonstrated that this is possible. We offered an open source template for uh, providers that want to be part of the network. Um, and uh, we tried to contact EIDAS nodes, you know, to uh, try to get attributes from them. Now, before the end, and there are a couple of more slides that I'm going to show you, um, just to um, 
be certain where we are, we are doing, uh, what are the most important elements, let's say, of the solution. Uh, first of all, in terms of age verification, there are two parts, the age verification and the parental consent. In terms of age verification, it's very important to note that the check is actually performed on the server side. It's not performed on the client side. Uh, there are good reasons for that. Uh, most solutions nowadays as well that are referring to identity, and I believe uh, almost all of them, they don't rely they don't rely on end user control, but they rely on a back end control. So the user has to submit some information, some credentials, in what form or the other, and then there is a back end that is checking that. In order to avoid uh, all those problems, security problems that we might have. Now, the other thing is that uh, users can't bypass, uh, bypass checks. Uh, there are workarounds. Uh, related to uh, other restrictions that we put in place. But in reality, when a user starts a check, uh, there is no way that a user can bypass it. And this is something that all the providers that have joined this prototype can demonstrate that quite easily. And the results are immediate. So the moment that you start the check, you get the results immediately. It's not like a check that you do uh, against, and you have to go to an office, for instance, uh, there are countries that are implementing, uh, still implementing the old solutions where a user has to go to a specific office, uh, get a key, and then based on that key continue uh, the journey. Um, this process is an online process, it's immediate, you get the results immediately, so you don't get user dissatisfaction, let's say. In terms of parental contr uh, control, uh, consent actually, the parents put the rules. Um, now, uh, we're doing a, a, a comparison here between age verification and parental control. It's clear that parental control is based on a parent initiative, and the truth is that the parents uh, do not enforce the rules all the time. Uh, there are statistics uh, across the world. Uh, I think that John has better statistics than me, but we're talking about 5 to 10 percent, I think, overall coverage of uh, children across the world being controlled by parents using a parental control system. Um, so uh, for me, the age verification, the age assurance overall, is, uh, is a process that is uh, much more important for the society uh, unless we arrive to the point where parental control can be implemented across the world, which is not the case currently. Um, Correct. Achievements. Uh, we started with resistance from the stakeholders. It's clear that almost nobody believed that we can achieve what we achieved during this project. Um, we managed to engage all possible stakeholders, and that was, for me, possibly the most important one of those achievements. Um, just like we had representatives in the advisory board in all of them. We, we tested and retested a, 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 an interoperable solution that worked. And uh, it was on top of that, it was an interoperable solution that fosters competition. So it's not a solution that is provided and does not allow competition, uh, but it's a solution, interoperable solution that allows the competition to thrive. And we continued listening, 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 and uh, reacting to uh, the needs and the requests from all the users, primarily the children. I believe that we achieved recognition across the board, and this is evident, being the fact that today um, we see hundreds of people registered for this conference, which is a great pleasure for us. And on top of that, uh, we are able to discuss openly uh, with major platforms, with regulators, with uh, governments, with all the people, all the stakeholders that recognize even the brand EU Consent. Overall, I would say that EU Consent was a success project, and that's why we moved to the next step. When uh, Sonia Livingston and the team and uh, other professors like Simone van der Hoef and uh, Abil Aschner did a final evaluation of the project, they clearly said that, you know, you have to do another step. You have to move to the next level. And the next level means that you have to be non-commercial. 
You have to continue your work, but you have to be non-commercial. And that's, we heard that comment, that statement from the professors, and that's how we finally created uh, the N EU Consent NGO in Brussels, ASBL. Um, and we did that because we heard the, the academics. Now we continued uh, the same, the NGO is based on the same more or less members as the original project. Uh, the advisory board more or less has the same members as before. And uh, yeah, clearly we need funding in order to continue the work because <laughs> sometimes it's, um, some of my friends used to say that the engine without oil doesn't move. So we need some oil in order to be able to, to do our work and continue um, being as, as good as we were before. So thank you very much for your time and uh, attention to what I just uh, presented. I'll pass the floor to Tony to give you more details about the standards and the other parts of the project. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Costas. <clears throat> I don't think I have any slides. I'm just going to talk. So, yep. So, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Allen. I am the chief executive of the Age Check Certification Scheme. Uh, we test that ID and Age Check systems work. So, our role is not to be a provider of age verification solutions or age estimation solutions, but to be the person or the people that are responsible for testing that they work so that you can have confidence in the, in the marketplace. And we've been involved in this project from the very beginning. In fact, I seem to recall that when we were uh, approached by the uh, commission about this particular project, I rang Costas and said, do you think this would be a good idea? And he said, yes. I'm not sure if he regrets that now, but uh, he, he said yes, and that's how we got involved in the project um, uh, from the uh, uh, European Union. I think what I want to talk about is really uh, a lot of, Costas has covered a lot of the detail of the, the kind of uh, what we, the way we approached it and what we did. But actually, um, one of the key things that we said, we, we did at the very beginning, was we set out and we agreed with the Project Advisory Board what the core principles were of this project, what we were, the, the core things we were, we were seeking to deliver. And there were five in total. The first one is that children have the right to participate in a digital world uh, to the fullest extent possible. One third of the world's internet users are under 18. They have absolutely got the right to be able to uh, access information, access learning, access toys, access games, access material, access things that their parents might not want them to access necessarily, but they have the absolute right to be able to do that. And so part of what we set out to build in the standards and the development that we did was about ensuring that that was our core number one principle, that children have the right to participate in a digital world. The second one is that the providers of digital services and content that is directed at children uh, should have a, a robust and trusted framework in which they can deliver high quality age appropriate materials. So you should be focusing on supporting industry and supporting the development of uh, uh, materials for children. One thing we were very conscious of, and I think the age verification world is very conscious of generally, is there's a risk with age verification that you end up with a, effectively a two-tier internet where you've got an internet for adults and you've got an internet for children. And because adults are the ones that spend money, the commercial focus would be on being delivering good quality services for adults and children would get left behind and have a, a, a less rich experience and less rich um, engagement with the internet. So it's not just, it's not about um, uh, restricting and, 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 and controlling and constraining. It's about enabling, it's about supporting, it's about having companies that are able to deliver high quality products and services for adults and for children. Uh, people with parental responsibility of children should have confidence in the standards and the framework to enable permissive content for their children. So if you're asking parents to play a role in how they uh, ex uh, exercise parental consent, or how they set up um, parental filters, they've got to have confidence in that. They've got to have confidence that that is something that is going to work for them and what they need and for their children and what their, their children need. And the standards and the framework and, the, uh, and all the 
rather dull and boring technical stuff that goes behind the scenes is what builds um, that, uh, that confidence. Um, adult services and, and, and content shouldn't be available to children. Um, we see things on, on the internet now uh, which uh, 30, 40 years ago you wouldn't even dream of seeing anywhere. Um, what, sh what is illegal offline should be also illegal online and yet we have uh, access to material that is um, uh, extremely um, uh, difficult, I think probably even difficult for adults as well to be, to be seeing. But we should, th there should definitely be some controls there. And the regulatory ecosystem should encourage market solutions through a robust framework of accreditation, certification and interoperability, which Costas has spoken about, across the European Union and now as we develop this project further uh, globally across the world. So there's a really important part of that principle, which is about it being market-based solutions. Uh, there was never at any stage in the, um, in the program any favoritism or, or thing put into relation to one age verification prior or another, even if there was a big disparity between the size of them or the reach of them or the um, uh, global applicability of them. They all had equal access. And one of the key principles of the materials that we generate, and there are some 34 publications as part of the um, phase one. Uh, they're all available online and uh, Alex and the team at uh, Lysel have got a, a, a great website where you can download them, access them, see them. Uh, all the, um, the, 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 the nodes and the tech is open source. It's all material that you can access. So if you wanted today to set yourself up an age verification company, you've got a good starting block there of things that you could do to start to build that and put that product out into the marketplace. It's also important when you think about the issue of um, uh, the market solutions. One of the critical things that is um, recognised in what we've done, but also I think becoming more and more recognised, is the uh, risk of concentration in a very small number of l large global platforms. Now, in one way, that's nice and easy for us as consumers. I have an Apple phone. Apple, uh, everything on there. Um, people have Google and they have um, Facebook or they have other uh, these global platforms. And they're great and they provide multiple services and they provide the things that we want so they're, they're driving that consumer need. But they come with a risk as well that you've got a concentration of your digital footprint in a very small, powerful group of people. And having market solutions for how you do age verification and age assurance helps to um, ensure that that uh, concentration is dissipated uh, out. Because one of the things that is of a concern is not, is not just about the privacy protecting aspects of you know, me uploading a copy of my driving license or, or my personal identifiable information, but also being able to track my digital footprint of what I do, what I choose to do, what my uh, life choices may be, good or bad, uh, what my uh, sexual orientation may be, what all those things are possible uh, to track if you get age verification wrong at that gateway to access um, on, the, on the internet. So it was really, really important throughout this project that we stuck to those five core principles. John and his, um, his board held, us, held our feet to the fire on it and made sure that we did and stepped in um, if, if, if they felt we were get, getting away from it. Um, but it also underpinned the development of, of the, the standards. So our task in the project phase one was to draft some standards that could be adopted uh, by the European uh, uh, Union. Uh, we did that, we completed that. There were three uh, standards, uh, all within the uh, EIDAS framework and within the uh, uh, ETSI, uh, ETSI uh, standardization template. Um, and those standards are uh, on the uh, uh, website for you to download for free to, to look at. Uh, there are three. One relates to uh, age verification, one relates to parental consent, and one relates to the certification process for both of those. What we're now looking to do as we move on to the next phases is we're looking to explore how those, those standards can be put into actual real practice. And of course, you know, nothing stands still. The world in which we operate in has moved along with um, uh, the, the standards as well. And I'm really pleased to be able to say that the International Standards Organization has adopted a project um, which I'm technical editor for, which is ISO 27566. 
and this will become the international standard for age assurance um, and it will cover the framework of what age assurance is what it's all about it will cover the certification benchmarking and analysis and it will cover uh, interoperability and uh, issues around guidelines for use in three separate parts to that that standard uh, that project uh, uh, got a bit of a boost in uh, Seoul in uh, a couple of weeks ago where it was moved on to the next phase um, and is now back out for a further consultation, global consultation. I very much recommend that you... Am I giving the wind up here? Or, uh, I very much recommend... Uh, it's not subtle, is he? Uh, the, uh, that you take the opportunity to connect with your national standards bodies uh, to participate in that development. So if you need any help with finding them or who they are, then do, do give me a shout. Um, but that's the way forward with this is through not just European standards, but actually international standards to make this globally uh, interoperable. And with that, I shall hand back to Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you very much, <coughs> Tony. I mean, just to, um, I mean, I work for the United Nations, another bit of it at the moment, and I can tell you at the last big event I was at in Vienna with over 150 different governments there, one of the, even though we weren't talking about age verification, they'd all heard about this project, and a lot of them, well not all, but a great number of them from Brazil, South Africa, India, all over the world, they were wanting to know more about this, just, just to underline that point about the importance of having global standards. So, the next session. Just, we have one quick question online. Go so on. if I could ask the panelists to take their seats for the next session while Costas asked, answers the question, which is, is the code written for EU consent open source? Uh, yes, the code is uh, open source and uh, Alexandra just responded with uh, the URL where uh, people can find it directly in the chat of uh, the conference. So yes, it just go to the website, EU consent website, and you will find in the project rules you will go to find the source code as well. Yes, and I think that's a stance we'll continue with going forward of being, you know, developing our code on an open source basis. Um, great, over to the next panel. If the other Co panelists so would like to take their seats. So, Costas, uh, Costas, you're meant to be up here again. Uh, this next session is called <coughs> Online Age Assurance, the State of the Art. So we've got Alistair Graham, Stefan, who's remote, Andy, Julie, where's Julie? Oh, Julie's there, and Costas again. We've, we have to... We have to stick to time because we've got people in the next session who are doing it remotely. So if I appear brutal, uh, forgive me, it's not my natural way, of course. I, 